It's really wonderful to see you all. Uh, my name is uh, Rick Locke. I uh, currently serve as the provost of Brown, and I'm uh, very happy to welcome you to the uh, presidential colloquium series, Thinking Out Loud, Deciphering Mysteries of Our World and Beyond. While this is a presidential uh, series, President Paxson was unable to join us this, this evening, and she sends her regrets. And I'm delighted uh, to be here and to offer a few remarks in her stead. Now, Thinking Out Loud was designed to do what Brown has sought to model throughout its history, to ask big questions and learn from others as solutions are pondered, shared, challenged, and refined. This series seeks to attract some of the nation's leading thinkers to provide accessible public talks on big picture topics in the sciences. During the last academic year, we were honored to welcome professors John Johnson, Emory Brown, Paula Hammond, Jim Gates, and Richard Tapia uh, to Brown. And the speakers have sought to explore such vexing questions like, are we alone? What is consciousness? And what guards our reality against oblivion? They have explored applying artful nanoengineering to kill cancers, uh, cancerless uh, cancer less, less toxically, toxically, and the role, I gotta fix my uh, writing, uh, and the role of math in understanding the universe. Now, these may see, sound like, probably not for this audience, but sound like uh, pretty uh, abstract uh, and intimidating uh, topics uh, for many people uh, in the general audience, but what's so great about this series is that it actually uh, brings very, very gifted people uh, who are able to make science accessible. And this is really important. Uh, and it's squarely not only uh, within the mission of the university, but it's also really important uh, for uh, the world uh, today. We know, for example, that there is a big disconnect between what scientists think and believe and what the general public's understanding of science. For example, a study on science and society conducted earlier this year by the Pew Research Foundation found that while Americans are upbeat about science, they don't always agree with scientists. The survey found that while 98% of scientists agree that humans evolved over time, only 65% of the general public concurs with this view. There's a 33-point gap between scientists and the general public when it comes to the role of human activity and climate change. And while 86% of scientists believe vaccination should be mandatory, uh, their views are sh shared by only 68% of the public. The study also found that respondents do not believe that scientists were in agreement on these findings when in fact they are. So learning about science is more than just fun, it's more than just sort of clarifying uh, big puzzles. It can affect our policies, our actions, and our choices. Now this series, uh, uh, Thinking Out Loud, is the brainchild of our own uh, professor of engineering, uh, Christopher Rose. Now Chris joined us uh, officially uh, this year as a faculty after being visiting uh, here for a year uh, from uh, Rutgers uh, University, where he was the founding member and former director of WinLab, which partners with government and industry to develop new wireless communication technologies. His field is communications theory, so it is no surprise that he sees tremendous value in communicating science, communicating knowledge, and inspiring people to challenge themselves uh, with uh, big questions. And Chris has played a leadership role. Anyone who knows him knows this kind of bundle, whirlwind of energy uh, and knowledge uh, that he brings uh, to everything he does. And he's been really, really super important uh, for this campus. I'm very grateful to Chris uh, for bringing these exceptional scholars uh, to Brown, to uh, organizing this wonderful uh, series, and for really helping us decipher uh, these mysteries, and I'd like to invite you to invite uh, our guest this evening, uh, Boston University Professor of Le Electrical and Computer Engineering, uh, Douglas uh, Densmore. So thanks, Chris. Okay, so welcome back for year two. Okay, so uh, one of the things, if, uh, how many people have attended one of these talks in the past, taking out loud talks? Okay, so you kind of know 
what I'm about to say. Hi, right there. And, get, and by the way, Doug is really good with kids, so don't, when, you, when the time comes to ask questions, be there. So I, I first met Doug uh, in a professional setting. We were down at the, at, we weren't at the National Science Foundation, but there was a National Science Foundation panel. And we were discussing all sorts of things. And I'm a communication theorist, and uh, as I tell everybody, what I do encompasses everything you do, be it biology, economics, political science, everything. You know, it encompasses everything that anyone could ever possibly do. And that's typical academic one-upsmanship. So, you know, that's what I was, uh, that's what I was plying, uh, applying at that uh, particular meeting. And, you know, I saw this kid, you know, over there. It's like, okay, so, you know, who, who is that guy? And uh, Doug got up and he started talking about synthetic biology. And I knew something about synthetic biology and, you know, wasn't really paying too much attention to the area because, you know, goodness, it's basically like bugs in a jar. And, you know, who could possibly use bugs in a jar? But what Doug did, uh, unlike other talks that I've seen, he got up and started laying out a methodology for how to design uh, biological systems to do things that, general things. And for those of you who are computer scientists, any in the, uh, so, you know, he was essentially saying you could, these were Turing machines, you could do whatever you wanted with them. And what impressed me, and I'm old enough to remember um, the, or the history at least, of the semiconductor industry, Andy Grove was a guy that consolidated, you know, there were transistors, there were all sorts of little piece parts for electronics, but the computer industry and the uh, electronics took off when Andy Grove and others put together and made things into a systematized sort of uh, way of doing things. That way you could build these big integrated circuits, you could build devices, and suddenly we had computers and you know, now we got cell phones that are more powerful than computers from World War II and uh, before. So you know, I, I call him Andy quietly, he doesn't like that, it makes him blush, but you know, tough luck. Uh, the other thing is that he's working in an area that is at the interstices of a number of different areas. And he'll tell you more about this, but I look for those sorts of people. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a decent judge of talent, but not just talent, I look for people that are slightly crazy, okay? And Doug fits that bill. So I just want to, you know, I'm so happy that he agreed to come and uh, talk to us and He's going to tell us all about how the computers of the future are going to be bacteria. So thank you so much, Doug, and I'll leave it to you. OK, this is great. It's, it's really exciting to be here. Thanks, Chris and Rick, for the introduction. I am excited to come here because I think of this, and I look at this as kind of a lecture hall here, as it is, with my opportunity that I have to educate you guys about synthetic biology, about programming, about the role that programming can play in the field of synthetic biology. So, what I have on this slide here is the title, Biology, Bugs, and Bits, Computing and Programming with Synthetic Biology. And the reason I chose these three pictures are for the following reasons. The picture on the left shows people in around the 1970s, early, like early 80s, hunched over photo masks, carving out the individual transistors and CMOS devices that are eventually going to be the individual computing paradigm for the computing industry. And if you imagine that happening today, that would be insane. People don't do that because of the billions and billions of transistors on a chip. Now we have CAD tools to do this. So this image shows what I would consider a bygone error in computing that we've overcome with software. The middle image is a microfluidic device, a device that moves small amounts of liquid around, and we can use that to do computing. And then the picture here on the far right is the idea that in biology or in engineering, we want to think about design flows that we specify, design, plan or build and learn from and do this in a holistic environment. So with that, let's get started. So what we have here is a video, and this is a video of how a bee comes into existence. This is inside a honeycomb. A larva is produced, fluids that the bee consumes are, are provided, and it grows from a basic pupa into a bee. And when you see this image, there's lots of ways to think about this. You could think about this if you were looking at this in the 1600s, if they had had video, you might have described this as magic. You would have said, this is magic. You might have attributed it to any number of things. As we've learned more and more, we've now called it biology. And what I'm going to make the argument for today is that in the 21st century and beyond, we're going to call this computing. We're going to call this a series of cells communicating with one another, doing different computations to form a living organism. 
that if you think about all of us, while we look different, we all have many features in common. And that's because the cell is carrying out a program that we just are learning how to crack today. And the same way these bees are executing a, a cellular program, it's my goal and other folks like me to harness that same programming infrastructure to make interesting new, new biological systems. And so the question is, what I'm making a case rather for is that biology is technology and information. And so if we believe this is computer science, we have to ask ourselves, what is the computer science of biology? What are the ones and zeros of biology? What is the if statement of biology? What is the go-to statement of biology? We have to realize that programming biology, while it has similar concepts, at some points is fundamentally different than programming electronic systems. And so really what we're asking ourselves as a community is how can 21st century computing expand to inform, influence, and inspire biology? So with colleagues at MIT, we've asked ourselves, well, if we could compute with biology, what would we do? Well, this is just a rough schematic. It's not important that you understand the details, but we could look at chemical production. What we could say is that in the presence of sugars as inputs, we could do some computation, these are schematics, and produce particular chemical outputs. And we could do this periodically so that we get sinusoidal kind of behaviors. We could also look at gene therapy. We could say, based on particular cell types, a colon and some biomarkers, we might produce specific drugs that could work to help uh, address human health needs. The microbiome in the gut. We might have detectors in the circuits that say, given a specific, a specific pH and that you're in the stomach, perhaps we can remove harmful cells or process other inputs. And we might have smart plants that respond to water, age, cold, and produce drought-resistant genes and different pesticides. So the idea of making a circuit inside a cell is not to make a computer, but rather to think about using the tools we would use to design computers and the way we think about computers and apply that to biology. So how would this work? What would this even look like? So what we'd need is a living organism. This is a bacterial cell. And what we'd say is what we need to do is we need to think about it having three major areas. We need to think about it having sensors, circuits, and actuators. And so we might have sensors that sense these types of elements, the nutritional state of the environment. Quorum sensing is a fancy way of saying when other cells are close to me. Secondary metabolites, other things in the environment that the cell is going to metabolize to turn into energy. We might want to sense these. Then we'd want to do some circuitry if this secondary metabolite and this nutritional state. Then we'd want to make actuators or genetic circuits or programs on the other end that then produce molecules. So we could say that these would sense certain conditions in your gut and then as a result would produce molecules to rebalance that environment. So you could think of this like a probiotic, but a specialized probiotic that's maybe tailored to your own personal genome by the creation of circuits. So the way this works in practice, when I talk to folks in electrical and computer engineering that haven't seen a lot of biological techniques, the way this effectively happens is we design some of this as DNA. We make lots of copies of it. That's what this picture is saying. We isolate this experimentally. We put it in special other pieces of DNA that we can put into cells, then we grow them up. So there's a process of designing this and then actually physically realizing it. So the idea of synthetic biology is starting to take off as a discipline. This is a comic that appeared in Nature, and this is this young boy going on these adventures of synthetic biology. And the notion is that he wants to design this new biological system. And instead of him being discouraged from doing this, he's encouraged, and he's encouraged to use engineering principles. So this field is growing, and it is built on the central dogma. The central dogma is a biological phenomenon that DNA becomes messenger RNA through a process called transcription and then becomes proteins by a process called translation. And what we ultimately want frequently are proteins. Proteins are kind of the building blocks, the workhorse of biology. They're what provide many cellular activities. So ultimately what we'd like is to abstract this. And we abstract proteins or genes as these arrows. Sometimes they look like this and say this gene is gonna make this protein, maybe a green fluorescent protein. And what I've come to find is it's not enough just to say I want these proteins. You need to provide mechanisms around them, other symbols that represent other DNA segments that help this central dogma happen. I have to turn this gene on with something called a promoter. I have to say stop making a gene at this terminator. 
And then you need other machinery, depending on the type of organism, that helps you go through this central dogma. This is called the ribosome binding site that helps us go from RNA to the proteins. So what I saw as an engineer, and what many of you have seen, if you're not familiar with this, what's important to me is there are parts and there are rules. If I don't hook this together in a certain way, it won't work. Just the same way you may not understand the electricity in your home, you realize if I don't plug my hair dryer into the wall, I'm not gonna be able to blow dry my hair. You don't need to understand the way the electricity is flowing, but you need to understand these basic input-output relationships. It's similar what we're trying to do in synthetic biology. And so what folks have done is they've started to curate repositories of these parts, where biologists, through the discovery process, have archived individual pieces of DNA they realize do certain things, produce proteins that help against certain uh, diseases producing proteins that fluoresce, et cetera, and different switches, these promoters, these arrows, that turn on in different ways. And they've archived these in registries, like this that was curated by a pro, uh, uh, an organization called the International Genetically Engineered Machine Competition. You can search them, and then abstractly speaking, if I want to put green part together with blue part, there's a chemical process, a biological process to do this to make composite systems. And this has led to an entire industry. You can call it the syndustry where we have biomaterials, bio, bioremediation, biosensing, biotherapeutics that are coming out of this industry. So let's say we wanted to build one of these systems. Again, there's a lot of things here. We're going to revisit this. This is the fire hose. But let's say you were an electrical engineer and you said, I want to make this circuit. This is called an XOR, an exclusive OR gate. And the way it works is you have two inputs, A and B. And if one of them is a zero and the other is a one, it produces a one, exclusively or, meaning exclusive. Only one can be a zero. If they're both, one can be a one, one can be a zero. If they're both ones, you get a zero. If they're both zeros, you get a zero. We can use this for many kind of computing applications. Then, for the purpose of this point in the talk, just imagine these are all my parts, and they've got switches and genes and all of this. So all you have to do, this is pretty simple to make this, right? I just say, let's pick those three. Let's put them together. So I'm going to have some inputs that sense different molecules. We're just going to put them together. We're going to stitch them together in this animation. And we'll stick a fluorescent report at the end, and we're done. So, you know, simple, no problem. This input, this promoter is going to sense an A, and this is going to sense a B. That's going to make this protein. That's going to shut this off, this purple arrow. Simple, right? No, not really. Software is going to be required. Somebody showed me this, and they had done it by hand. They were a biologist that understood all these parts and all these graphs, and they said, I want the purple one and the, and the blue one and the orange one. My point when I saw this is if we want to do this in a rational way, at any stage, at any level of complexity, we're going to need software. The same way that if I want to put together a billion transistors to make a genetic circuit using these basic parts, we're going to need computers. Computers are going to help us check for correctness. Computers are going to help us check for phenomena like toxicity. Computers are going to help us track who's doing this for security. They're going to be very vital. We're going to revisit this process in my talk. So I wanted to acknowledge the fact that you may be saying, oh, this is great. Boston University is doing synthetic biology. I am sure there are folks in this audience, including Gary, that I wanted to make sure that you guys understand that synthetic biology is being done here at Brown. Minimally, it's being done through their iGEM team. So these are all logos from Brown University, along with Stanford, their iGEM team here on campus. And I would encourage you guys to get involved. They've been doing interesting things like building materials in this bioregami project that could talk about how they could fold and be compact for space exploration. Uh, how you can get organisms survive in harsh extraterrestrial conditions. How to do biological communication, biodegradable UAVs. Lots of cool stuff. And I wanted to point out as well, the folks doing that, Gary's in the audience, I don't know if Lynn is here, but there are folks here at, Br at Brown that are doing synthetic biology, and I would encourage you to chat with them and learn about how you can do synthetic biology. And here are just some snapshots I took from the website of the teams. And again, I, I want you guys to understand, one of the things about synthetic biology that's really important to me is that the process I described be democratized. Just the same way that if you want to make an Android app, it's not Google's philosophy that no one does that. We keep that to ourselves and we just release it when we're ready. They've democratized that process. And as a result, we've had tremendous innovation. It's my expectation that synthetic biology be the same. So let me tell you a little bit about myself. I went to the University of Michigan with the expectation I was going to be a video game designer. I had wanted to go to a school called DigiPen, which was Nintendo's video game school, and I was confident I was going to make the next Mario or the next Zelda. As, as I got to school, I realized I actually didn't like programming in an under, as an undergrad, which is strange given this talk. 
but I also wasn't very artistic, and I still am not in, in the way that you need to be to make a multi-million dollar video game. So I said, let's give hardware a try. So I did four internships at Intel, and each time I said, well, next summer's gonna be better, next summer's gonna be better, next summer's gonna be better, and I never, it wasn't that I disliked Intel, Intel's a fabulous company. It was that I wasn't able to independently explore my own research ideas. And so I realized I better get a PhD. So I went to Cal, where I worked with a professor named Alberto San Giovanni Vincentelli. If you don't know him, that's fine, but he's responsible for every computer that you guys have. He's someone that's known as kind of the grandfather of computer design in this particular field, and he's designed the algorithms that make modern microprocessor design possible. And he always drew this picture that said, when you're designing a system, you have this idea of an application and an implementation. So just abstractly, I could say an application is going from A to B, a function. I want to go from, from Brown to Boston University. The implementation for that could be a car, a plane, a train, a bus. And depending on which one I choose, they have different costs, time, money, fuel, et cetera. His idea was we map this application to a platform. And he always drew these, what we called the Alberto San Giovanni Vincentelli triangles. And so my PhD, you don't need to read all of this, was making computer-aided design to do embedded systems. So this is saying that we had some processing elements that, pro that act like computers, and we had an operating system, and we had tasks. And this is a diagram from my thesis that said how this was all going to work in this design flow. What's funny when I show this is in 2008, when I first started to biologist, I said, well, couldn't we use this same methodology for biology? Well, actually, let me back up. I worked some more, didn't like it anymore. And then I went to some place for a postdoc called the Joint Bioenergy Institute, where they make biofuels. And I said, we can take the same idea that Alberto had, and now we could say, well, we could talk about biological functionality, that we have bacteria and they swim towards different proteins, depending on the presence or absence of an inducer. That's the function I want. Then I could say, here are all the biological ATCs and Gs that could implement that. And so what was interesting was, what parts do I choose to match that functionality? And again, maybe you think, oh, that's very abstract, but that's what we were doing at the time was being very abstract. But the idea was if we separated function from implementation, that could be very powerful. It lets some groups of folks think about how things could be done and others how they are done, unless you experiment things differently. So how did I get involved then? So this was great. So how could you all get involved? I got involved through iGEM at UC Berkeley, this International Genetically Engineered Machine Competition I was telling you about at Brown. So when I first got in, I realized I didn't know anything. But I did realize the biologists, I said, well, how are you storing your data? How are you storing all these fabulous parts? And they said, well, we've got this great system. It's called Excel. And what we do is we put all our stuff in Excel, and we put it on Joe's computer. And whenever Joe wants to share it, he emails it to Jane. And then Jane cuts and pastes it and puts it in. No problem, flawless. And I said, well, we can do better than that. We probably could have a database, and you don't have to mail files around, and you can import and things but I didn't know what tools they needed. So I created this system called Clotho. Clotho was named after the Greek fate that spun the thread of life. So I had to have some auspicious name for the, for the tool. And the tool is basically a glorified database on the side that connects all the biologists to their parts. And these little icons are apps that you would write, because I don't know what you need. So I gave you an interface to that database where they could write their own apps. Think of it like the iPhone, where the iPhone, in theory, isn't very useful unless it's connected to a wireless network. Clotho isn't very useful unless it's connected to a repository of parts. Then you write apps on top that do all kinds of things. And we made over 40 different apps for Clotho. Sequence viewing, seeing DNA sequences, managing parts, et cetera. So that was cool, and the community used it, and they liked it, and I became known for Clotho. In fact, I'm still relatively known for this software program. Then in 2009, I said, well, I want to make a programming language, and I called it Eugene, because I wanted to make a program. And this is little Eugene, red hair and all of this. And Eugene is this idea that biologists would say, well, we know how to design biology. You put A with B, and then you don't, but no, wait, no, wait. B doesn't go with A, and, well, no, not if it's C is there. Well, C is there, then it needs to be with D. And they had all these complicated rules, and they were in this magical place called their notebook, <laughs> which was a piece of paper on their desk. And when they were on vacation, we were out of luck, because the notebook was not to be found. So I made a language that lets us describe these complicated relationships, but formally, and computably, and shareably. And again, the idea is you have parts and rules, you shake them all up, and then you get new biological systems. So I made those two systems, and through those, that was enough for the synthetic biology to say, okay, we're, you're serious, come to, into our community and get involved. And so I did this as a postdoc, and then I moved into this area as a professor. 
So what do I do now? I run a lab called CIDR with an A, which is the cross-disciplinary integration of design automation research, which is a mouthful, but it lets me pivot because it's design automation. So I can go into electronics or biology. I didn't commit. I didn't call it the Densmore Lab because no one in electronics calls their lab after their last name. That's way too egotistical. So everyone has a name of their lab after something else. So I call it the CIDR Lab. And I started with these two programs, Eugene and Clotho, and now I've expanded to many more software tools that I make. I'm going to be talking about some of them. I have tools that let us uh, design data sheets. I have a social media tool called Phagebook. Bacteriophage are, are viruses that infect bacteria, so we call it Phagebook. I'll be talking today about this tool, Cello and Fluigi, primarily. And they work in specification, design, build, test, and data. So I organized around those concepts, and it's top to bottom. The ecosystem that I've created is my lab does cool stuff, but I can't keep track of all the software over the years. I get tired, people move on. So what happens when the software is complete and published, it transitions to a nonprofit that I've created called the Nona Research Foundation, and Nona curates open source software for the entire community. And the idea is that it will not only curate my software, but it will start to curate other software in the future. We launched in 2013, and I now have an executive director in money, which is important, and we're gonna be really getting going here in 2016. Then, after that software is there, my startup, Lattice Automation, can take that software, either it's, it can either get it from Nona, license it from BU for me, or create their own, and we can make commercial grade biodesign automation tools. So that's the ecosystem that I've, 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 I've started to create. And I put this up because students trying to often, they say, well, what about, are you concerned about research? That's CIDR. Are you concerned about open source sharing a community? That's Nona. Are you interested in commercial applications? That's Lattice. So I've kind of tried to accomplish all three. I'm someone who kind of likes to do a lot of things, top to bottom. I can never pick. So I'm trying to do all three. Well, you guys will have to let me know how I do over the years. So also, in my group. So Doug, this is really cool, but how do you do this? Is, aren't, don't you have a lot of people in your group? I have over the years, and this is an image that gets to that and to the people I need. I need postdocs in computer engineering. I need graduate students in computer engineering. I need master's students in engineering. I need undergrads in computer engineering. I need computer scientists postdocs, technicians, graduates, undergraduates, high school students. I need bioinformatician postdocs, grad students, master's students, bioengineering grad students, master's students, and undergrad students. And then I need molecular and cell biology postdocs and graduate students. So my group has run the gamut over the years, and people have said, well, how do you mentor them? And I'd, I'd like to say, well, uh, what I really need to do is build that infrastructure where I have postdocs that are doing things that I'm not an expert in, that's the cell biology, while I tend to mentor more of the computational students. And I think what's really interesting is we've kind of harmonized and come up with a really nice ecosystem that gets people exposed to lots of things. And when I started, I was concerned about the jobs these students would have, but if folks that are following synthetic biology understand now there's an ecosystem where this is a dedicated field and people are able to get jobs. So I'm, I feel I can sleep better at night knowing that these students will be employed. And I think their parents will too. So what is my vision for something I'm calling biodesign automation? If you look at electronics, it's taboo to call it CAD. CAD would be an oversimplification. It's called electronic design automation or EDA. My vision for biodesign automation looks something like this. The idea is, and again, it's not important you understand all of this, but it's important that you say on the left, somebody wrote something in quote unquote English. You may not be able to read it in English, but it's a program. Something that a computer scientist would write. This is actually an example of a computer science language called Verilog that can make a hardware microprocessor, can make a microprocessor. So the idea is someone's going to write something that's a program. It's gonna go through some processes. Then, a then what we're gonna do is we're gonna convert this into a circuit that we understand in electronics. So again, it's not important you understand all of this. What's important to say is that all three of these are equal, and these, all of the, each of these also does what was written here. I've made it this way, this final circuit, because now what I have is a set of biological building blocks. These are the circuits I showed. These are all pieces of DNA. Every symbol here is a piece of DNA, and I'll describe what it does in the central dogma. And all these little curves tell us how it performs. So our job is to take one of these pictures and put it onto one of these circuits. And you need to do it in such a way that the output protein of one of those gates that goes into the next gate matches up. 
And you need to do it in such a way that it's not toxic to the cell, and you need to do it in such a way that the levels of each input are compatible. All that stuff I just mentioned is hard to do in your head, so a genetic compiler is going to do that and predict what our outputs would be at different states. Then the final step of design automation takes these pieces of DNA and says, well, I need the, the green one and the red one and the dark green one. These are all the different ways I could put that together physically. Because the little dirty secret about biology is nothing works the first time. So instead of making one circuit and saying, I'm done, we try to make hundreds of circuits that are all slightly different, see which ones work, and the ones that work are great, and we use them as positive examples. The ones that don't, we use as negative examples. And then we run machine learning algorithms on top of these to learn what works and what doesn't. And we feed that back into the software. Like my machine learning algorithm, my father, is never tell him to be somewhere on time, always tell him a half an hour early. We can learn similar traits about the way biology works. Hopefully they're on time, but we can learn different things from them. So the first project I'm going to talk a little bit more in depth on is Cello. Cello is another cutesy name, but it stands for Cell Logic. And this is a collaboration that I have with myself at BU, with my team, and then at the Synthetic Biology Center at MIT. And this is the, very, this is the vision I just described, that we would start with a computer. You would sit down and say, hmm, I, need to want, I want to make a fluorescent protein if I am in this soil type and I detect TNT. So if I see TNT, the explosive, and I see this soil type, I want to make a green fluorescent protein. I'm going to make that and put it in a plant cell. So when I plant plants in a field, if they change a different color, they could be on top of a landmine. So I want to make that circuit. So I just write that, quote unquote, just write that. And then a genetic compiler makes that. That's what Cello is getting at. So how would this work? I'm an engineer, so I got to have a little Little, little technical piece in here. So these next slides, I'll try to go through and just get people the flavor. But the idea, again, in Boolean algebraic logic are that you have ones and zeros, ons and offs. They represent, typically, in computing, a transistor either open or closed. This is called a truth table that says when I have A and B, zero, zero, I should not be on. When I have zero and one, I should be on, one and zero. This is this XOR. You can turn this truth table into a series of equations. How that's done is not important for this talk, but just trust me, you can turn that truth table into the series of equations. Then you can turn that series of equations into gates. This slide has nothing to do with biology, and that's the cool part. Meaning that if I show this slide to a design automation audience, they get it instantly. They can contribute to synthetic biology, because they realize how to do this. How to make many different circuits that we could give to a biologist to try to implement, and they don't have to understand biology. So this is a, a connection point for computer science. So eventually you pick a circuit and say, okay, I like this circuit. This is good. It's smaller than the other ones. Then we had this idea of a gate. So I can describe this briefly, because you might be wondering, what does it mean for a gate? This is a NOR gate. A NOR gate is a special gate that if you have a 1, you have one of these two inputs is a 1, the output is a 0. Doesn't matter which one. Doesn't matter if they're both 1. If there's at least 1, you will get a 0. NOR gates are nice because I can build all of Boolean logic with just NORs. The way this NOR works is if one of these, let's say imagine there's a protein floating around. It's floating around, it lands at this arrow, or it lands at this one, either one. It's going to be a 1, which is going to end up turning this gene on. This gene is going to float away and then shut off this downstream gene. So what happens is if this gene is produced by having a 1, it shuts something off later, making a zero. And you get a function that says, we can start, if something's on, if we have a zero, oh, if we have a, a zero, we have a one, it's off. And this is the level of protein going down. We can make gates. So now the idea is we have our library of gates, and what's going on here is that I'm, apply, I'm saying, let's try these different gates in different places in my circuit, and I'm predicting the score. And I'm giving a score that travels along. So the, what the computer software is doing is going through an algorithm that's saying the gates that you gave me that are experimentally characterized, how can I assign them? And it's doing this by collaboration with computer scientists who are writing the software and algorithms and biologists who are measuring these gates and making them. I can't make the gates myself. I can, but I'm not very good at it. My lab is not very fast. Whereas the lab I work with at MIT has made hundreds or thousands of these gates and characterize them. 
They have hundreds of thousands, but they say, we don't know what to do with them, we need your software. So again, I'm gonna emphasize this repeatedly, that there are lots of collaboration opportunities where either folks, either biologists lack domain-specific expertise, expertise, uh, expertise, and biologists lack kind of the software knowledge. So we can work together to do this. And there's a score. So we've made lots of circuits. If you take a three input circuit, you have so many combinations, you have eight combinations of the ones and zeros. So if you have three inputs, it can be zero or one, you get eight of those. If you take a look at those eight outputs, they can be ones or zeros. So if you do the math, you get 256 possible three input circuits. We've built them all. It's almost a megabase of DNA. So every single A, T, C, or G in the DNA is called a base. We almost have a million of them to build all of these circuits. We've built them all, and over 75% of them work like we'd expect. The other 25% we have fed back in, learned rules, so when we rerun, those circuits start performing much better. This is a paper for the bio folks in the room, like this is amazing, where is it? It's in review in science. And so this is something that if you come to me afterwards and want to know more about it, I'd be happy to talk about that. You guys can cross your fingers that it comes out of review in science. Um, so that's what's going on. Let me show you the software. So this is Cello. You go to Cello and you log in, and you say, oh, I'm Brian, let me, let me get started. So then you choose your inputs. These words don't mean much to you guys, but they're effectively saying, what do I want to sense? That's the TNT, that's the soil, that's the, the, the gut conditions. You're choosing them, and you're giving information about the DNA. The Verilog now, because this person's a really fast typist, they write exactly what they want to see. That's effectively, admittedly, you need to know some programming here, but you write what you'd like to see. So then, what we have is the ability to say, which organism do we want this to run in? Do we want this to run in E. coli? This is good E. coli. This is E. coli that we actually have in our system now. Or do we want to do it, depending on the E. coli system, you also choose an output. What do I want the response to the circuit to be? Do you want it to be another protein? Do you want it to be a fluorescent molecule? What should happen? So again, I haven't gone in the lab at this point. I'm sitting at my computer with a cup of coffee designing a biological system. So you're saving these. These things are familiar. We have some options. You come in and you're going to run this program. You're going to validate it because you always need to validate things. There's lots of side effects of this. We're logging who's doing what. We know who's making this. We know when they made it. We know what parts they made it. So there are important checkpointing and, and safeguards as well that are built into the system. So now we're running. This is the part where computer scientists get to make this faster. So it's going to run, and what it's doing is what I showed you. It's picking the colors for those gates and checking the score. And it's saying, well, here's what I found. Here's your schematic. Think of those boxes actually as those NOR gates. And here are some candid circuits. So this looks good. You can look at them and say, this looks good. You can look at all of those little score, those, those transfer curves that said how this per performed over time, make sure things look okay. You can look at the predicted performance. These distributions are the fluorescence over time of the cell in different bins. And we can say, we can say oh, these fluorescence are either high, meaning it fluoresced, or low, it didn't. And then we actually get a DNA, something called a plasmid, a circular piece of DNA, we get that out. And what does that mean? Some people think that my computer is actually putting DNA out of the disk drive. And disk drive is probably dating myself. Right? There's no disk drive. The DNA is oozing out of my computer. There's no DNA that oozes out of my computer, but I'm given a file that I can send to a company called the DNA Synthesis Company and have it chemically produced. So I've effectively made a design file. So those are the kinds of things that are going on in Cello. So that is one vision for biodesign automation, and I've made many tools along this. Given the length of my talk and the techn technical nature, I can't go into all of them. But that was one idea. Now, if you recall, what I said is I had so many genetic parts. Let's say I had 50 in my library, and all of them were different colors. Why are they different colors? Because if what, like when I make a circuit in electronics, I say I'm going to be wired to you, or I'm wired to you. And there's no way for electrons, in general, to leave those wires. They have to stay on them. But when I make a cell circuit, a cellular circuit, you're in the cytoplasm of the cell, which is this liquid environment. And proteins are floating around. They're very promiscuous. They're going around interacting with anything they can. So what happens is, if you don't have proteins that are very different or orthogonal, your circuit is going to cross-react. So we have a limited number of parts we can use. So what some people have said is, let's take a circuit like I did before, and put this in a cell by itself, 
this in a cell by itself, this in a cell by itself, this in a cell by itself, and create a protein that goes out of the cell, it leaves it, and goes into another cell. So we don't have, we have promiscuity, but at the boundaries of cells. And they did some experiments. So I said, that's cool. So let's have a complicated circuit, and let's have this talk. The question is, even though it's at the boundaries of cells, I can't guarantee that I'm only going to go to neighbor one or neighbor two. So what I thought was, well, couldn't we do better? Couldn't we take these circuits, put them in cells, and isolate them in a small device called a microfluidic device? So something that moves small volumes of liquid around, I could isolate all those parts. And I could put valves that control when those intercellular fluids go from one place to another. And I could control those valves with a computer. And since I'm already talking to a computer, I could have small embedded electronics that are talking to the computer. And they could talk to each other. And they could talk to off-chip uh, off, uh, off processors. And then they could talk to entire systems of, of these other chips. And I could have a distributed system that I would call this hybrid bioelectronic system. So now you can imagine, what's this good for? Imagine I made a circuit that detected arsenic in, in drinking water. I locate this device one place in the river, another place, another location in the river, another location. They're wirelessly communicating to one another, saying, I've seen arsenic, have you seen arsenic? No, I haven't. Why don't you ratchet up your sensitivity a bit? Because maybe you're missing it. My sensitivity is level one. Your sensitivity should be level two. So it, they can communicate and adapt in real time. That's the vision. So my flow before was to use the tools I just showed. I didn't show all of these. But my flow before was start cello and go through some of my other design software and go into a bacteria. My new system with microfluidics is called Fluigi. And the idea was that now, instead of getting DNA out or bacteria out, we're going to get control, we're going to get microfluidics, designs, and electronics. So we're going to be making these hybrid bioelectronic systems. And there are advantages to these things, kind of the thing, what I outlined. This is a big chart. The CAD people in the room, if there are, are folks here, would appreciate that there's a method to this madness. I'm not going to go through all of this, but what's nice is someone like myself can sit down and say, well, we've got to, we've got to put gates, we've got to control valves, and we've got to make actual devices, we've got to make 3D models, and we've come up with a flow that does all of this. I'm happy to talk about this at the end of my talk if you'd like. So this experiment here looks like this in microfluidics. So you can't see them, but each of these cells would live in this little intersection here. So we'd put four cell types. And in these inputs, we would flow some of these inputs we have here, along with media and cells. And then a control program would control these valves to open and, and, open and close them. And you might be like, this is really hard. How do I wrap my head around which should open and which should close? The answer, again, is software. The software program that synthesizes the circuits I showed previously, we now have converted to synthesize microfluid devices and their control code. So then you have a choice. I can try to do this in vivo in a cell, or I can do it in vitro in a microfluidic. We've gotten pieces, so some of these people in the room are like, does this really work? Not yet. We can move colored liquids through this correctly. Getting a cell to live in a microfluidic environment has numerous challenges. That's where we're moving to. We're also finding synthetic biological systems that work what we call cell-free, or outside of cell. So we're working on these. So I don't want anyone to walk away and say, oh, you know, this guy's got it all figured out. We don't. So here's a CAD system that we've created called 3DUF, or 3D microfluidics, the U being the mu symbol, 3D microfluidics. The red, pick the red colors are valves, places where the channels get closed. The blue lines are where liquids flow. And this is just showing a CAD framework where you could go in like Microsoft, like paint, and you can draw lines around and make your own microfluidic. What it does is it prevents you from making a microfluidic that doesn't work because it adheres to certain spacing guidelines. What's being shown there was that you can then export this microfluidic to a 3D printer. We print it on a glass slide, so we print the layout on a slide, then we pour something called PDMS, it's a chemical like silicone, that's rubbery, that we can pour around the mask, and we start to make these chips. You're like, but Doug, didn't you say you made a whole compiler? That's true. That's separate from this flow. This is a manual way to do it, but people often like to make manual flows. So this is an example. I'm not going to go through all of this because I'm keeping track of the time, but this is something that people can, that you can play with, and I'm happy to talk about. 
it's showing the vision. And you might be like, well, that's not very exciting. Uh, don't people already have CAD tools for microfluidics? Well, voila, again, I'm in the right place at the right time. The answer is no, and the ones they have aren't very good. So what do we make with this thing? So here's an example of a device we 3D printed onto a glass slide. That's a glass slide. And this little 3D printed piece in the back allows us to pour uh, this, this silicone solution into it and we can get something to work. So then again, this is showing colored liquids moving. This is a special device we're calling a transposer. And what the transposer lets us do is say we can take fluid and go from here to here or from here to here or here to here. This makes a general routing device. So if I have a C of these, I can say go from any point on the left to a point on the right by controlling these valves. So we've shown again that we can get this to work. And so when I started this, people said, Doug, you don't know anything about microfluidics. I said, well, that's fortunate because I don't know anything about biology either. But that never stopped me. Uh, and so again, my students are always nervous. Like, we don't know what we're doing. I'm like, good, that's how we're going to make something cool. Because if we knew all about it, we'd make a lot of assumptions. So we're learning about how to print these. And, you, and so the other piece about this is we can do this in my lab in hours. We can make a device, and in an hour we have a new one. So it wasn't about making the best device. It was about making one cheap and fast so that it democratized it again, that you could make this in your lab with the software and hardware we make open source. So there's an example of one of my students holding one of these devices. And it just says, there's lots of bubbles, there's lots of problems. But he said, this isn't working. I said, well, how many times did you try? He's like, three. I'm like, that's pretty good for the third try. So I I'm still have lots of faith in, this, faith in this process. We're exploring other techniques I'd be happy to talk about. So here's another video. I may end this one prematurely as well. But this is an example that here is a transposer he made. But he made this with a CNC mill. So he took a piece of plexiglass, effectively, put it in a milling machine that sits on our desktop, milled out that same transposer, 3D printed syringe pumps, wrote a, a script that's basically Python in Perl that controls this. And what it's saying here is I want the red solution to go, we have red and blue, and I'm going to send the red solution over here, over here, and the blue solution is going over here. And the reason you don't see the blue solution here is it's, con it's under this white tape. But it's like a switch that you can control. And that's going to be really important if we want to route fluids to certain places. And so for the, the, I see some young kids in the audience, this is like a playground. This is an example of in the lab, if you're thinking about research, it's something that we said we wanted to do. We bought a couple hundred dollars worth of supplies and just started doing it. And so I think that's what's really exciting is that we can do that at this stage. You can see this one, my students like to see, you can see it leaking. It's not perfect. There's some problems there. But again, that's probably a $2 device. So what we also did for fun is we said, we're going to make E. coli tweet. We want E. coli to tweet to, to one another. So we said, we're going to have some inputs. What they're going to do is they're going to talk to a computer and an output. So what we did is we made one of these systems where we had uh, a pH probe in a bacterial solution. So we actually had a probe that measures pH. And we fed the bacteria basically solutions that would make them produce lactose. And that lactose, when it's in high concentrations, changes the pH. This would be measured and say, hey, I'm high pH. It would communicate that to a Raspberry Pi, which then tweeted, hey, I am high pH. This is the Twitter feed. It's Twee coli. And what it's basically tweeting out is, hey, I'm different pHs. That is then communicated to another chip that says, hey, you should control a syringe pump that controls another set of bacteria to get them to glow. Now, it's a toy experiment. Twitter's not necessary. Twitter's, you know, kind of sensational. But the idea is that we had an experiment happening in one place, and the bacteria were communicating. Now, they're not communicating in the traditional sense, in, in the way bacteria normally communicate. They're communicating through what I'd call an electronic biotransducer. And so again, this is kind of a proof of concept showing that if we had these disparate biological communities in a circuit, they might be able to communicate in interesting ways. And what we can do, what we can really do, is get electronics to do what electronics do well, compute, and biology to do what biology does well, sense, reproduce, adapt, and get these systems to come out. So you might be like, well, this is cool. Can we get it? Oh, it's probably all secret. Again, my philosophy is everything is open source. So we have repositories of this. You can get these designs from us. So again, it's not my, I have, I'm actually incentivized to have impact by getting the community to be able to do this. So my colleagues are often like, shouldn't you patent this? Shouldn't you do this? I, I'm not built that way. And also, I don't have patience for lawyers. So it's, it's largely open source. 
Here's an example of the setup in the lab. We had some output nodes and input nodes and sensors and talking to each other. So it's a really interesting environment, again, requiring interdisciplinary teams. So a little couple of pitches at BU. I'm going to be wrapping up in the next five minutes. So BU is committed to synthetic biology, and I encourage folks, again, I hate to give a talk at another university and give a pitch for my own, but let me do that for a second. BU is really committed to synthetic biology, and as such, we've created this team that I think is a real, really a world-class team around something we're calling the Biological Design Center. If you know anything about BU, you know, you know it's located right downtown BU, I mean Boston, right by Fenway Park, more or less. And there's a main drag that goes through. We're building a, a lab right on top of, right on Com Ave. And I'm calling it the damp lab because it's not wet and it's not dry. And then it stands for Design, Automation, Manufacturing, and Prototyping. The building is going to look like this. It's anticipated to be completed in May of 2017. It's going to be here. If you recognize ComAv, you can't really see this, but it's a parking lot. So we lose some parking, but we get a big building. And people say, well, the parking lot's in the garage, in the basement. Well, there's no basement because that part of BU, of Boston, is on landfill. So we can't go unless we want to be in the Charles River. So there's no garage. It's green. You need to commute in to the T. And then here's some pictures of what my lab is going to look like for folks. But it's big. It's about 1,500 square feet just for this lab space. And what's it going to do? It's going to do things like control robotics. So for example, I have a software tool called Puppeteer that's going to be controlling the robots in this lab. And what Puppeteer does is help you automate your experiment. You say, hey, Puppeteer, this is when I'm free. You go to your Google Calendar and say, I want to build DNA today, but I only want to do it between noon and 3 and and two to four, and in case of my students, four to five, lunch break. And then you log in, once you've told the Puppeteer when you're free, and Puppeteer says, well, who's going to be doing this? You select some personnel, and you upload something called an assembly graph. I didn't detail how this comes about, but I said I was putting parts A, B, and C together. We have software that tells you how to do that. So that instruction set for putting those parts together goes to Puppeteer. This is a graph that says what you're going to do. And it tells you all the things you need to do in the lab. What are all the reagents? What are all the resources? Then you go back to your calendar and go, oh, look it, Puppeteer gave me something to do. And you use that voice, too. <laughs> then you go in, and it's, you can't read this because we need to, too much computer science here. But the idea is that it gives you a protocol with checkboxes that are supposedly idiot proof. I'll have to figure this out. And it tells you exactly what to do. Then you go back in and say, hey, Puppeteer, I did what you said. You update some data and say, hey, I assembled this. You update it. And then it gives you new tasks. So right now, what I'm doing is I'm saying, oh, I did the, the magenta task. And then let's go back and see what they wanted me to do. So it keeps repeating that process. There are some steps that are manual. I have to do by hand because I don't have a robot yet that's a butler that opens fridges, that you know, can do all the pieces of a biological protocol. We do have robots, however, that can do all the pipetting. We can do that really well. So some of the protocols that are produced connect directly to a robot. And what I'm showing at the end of this is that the robot, once it's set up by the human operator, will actually get executed. So this is going in, and this is a robot that's in my lab. And the robot says, oh, I need to go get this plate. So it grabs a plate that has DNA. It moves it around, sets it down on the space, and then we can start going about our execution. So the vision is that same computer I sat down and made my genetic circuit and drank my coffee, then I push go, and the robot makes it. That's where I'm getting at in the future, and this building's going to help that. One other thing that I'm working on is the intersection of, of biology and what we call cyber-physical systems, which one might argue cyber-physical systems are already at the intersection of biology. So myself and some other people at BU MIT and the University of Pennsylvania were awarded a grant recently to have these biomicro robots, to have actual robots interact with living cells. So this is the work that we're doing through NSF. And the idea would be that we'd have a place, a plate. And on this plate, there would be some cells, and there'd be some little robots. And when I say little robots, I mean little robots. I'm not going to go through this schematic, but these are special cells that communicate extracellularly. So they can tell each other, hey, I'm nearby you. Hey, I'm not nearby you. You can talk about where you're, if you're close or far. And that's interesting, because when we're close, I can say, hey, I'm going to make red. Why don't you make red? And say, hey, you're far away. Make green. And when you know the distances, you can make interesting patterns. When you make interesting patterns, we can use that for manufacturing, because we can make patterns that turn into materials, patterns that turn into 
uh, manufacturing artifacts. So it's important to make patterns for any number of reasons. Then there's this biocompatible robot that, again, the folks at Penn make and can explain much better. But this is a picture of this little robot under a microscope that's actually moving cells into position. So it's pushing the cells next to one another. And so it can push cells to each other. And now that they're close, I can say, now you're close. You better make green. Now you're far away, make red. So we can start to program the patterns that the cells will make. Again, this grant was announced in, in uh, basically May. So don't ask me for all the results yet. But this is where we're moving. We're trying to put together an interdisciplinary team that does small robots, ID design automation, and then control systems folks from mechanical engineering get involved. So again, really cool interdisciplinary work. So perfectly timed, I think. There's no way to summarize all of this. There's too much. But I hope that you took away from this. Hopefully, you're excited. Hopefully. You're thinking, biology is going to be cool and programmable in the future, and where might I fit in all of this? And it, that might be one question. You might also be saying, what are the ethical and safety considerations about all of this? I haven't had a chance to address all of those. You might be saying, what societal challenges will emerge because of this, or which ones can we solve because of this? And we know that we're going to have interesting challenges in computing around how we specify, design, build, and verify these systems. I'm not going to go through all of these, but there are many. And if I would actually argue that I probably left you with more questions than answers. And so I hope that along this pursuit of those answers, you will get involved in the synthetic biology community and help us think about how we program biology. So with that, I want to kind of thank, there's lots of folks, they're not here. It's a too long a commute for my grad students, I guess. Um, I've got a lot of folks in my lab, and this is just one snapshot. It's impossible to wrangle all of them together. This is probably half of my lab. There's always, a consi there's always some reason they can't get together. I've got I to have some fun event, trick them with beer and food. Um, so lots of folks, lots of different funding. But I want to point out two last plugs. One plug is, oh, we want to learn more. You can go to our web, our, we have a website, all that, but our YouTube site is pretty cool. It doesn't have all the tutorials you need, but it, it shows you a lot of the software running. So that's at site, YouTube, Cider Lab. The other thing is I've started a workshop called the International Workshop on Biodesign Automation. Not to be confused with the Iowa Wholesale Beer Distribution Association, which is the first hit for many years, but now we're on the ninth workshop. We finally beat them in the Google rank. That is going to be 16th through 18th this coming year in Newcastle, England. So again, if you're interested in getting involved in the community, that's a great workshop to come to. And so I thank you all for coming out in the evening, and I hope I sparked your imagination about what could be done with biology. And with that, I will thank you guys all again and take any questions. All right, thanks for your great talk. This was really interesting. Um, now I finally know what you're doing. Mm. I, I knew about your work, but now I have finally had a chance oh, to really see in more detail. Um, so I have a, actually kind of an, a, um, a specific question, maybe related more toward the first part you talked about, uh, cello. Mm -hmm. And you're showing us these gates and um, how you're uh, creating these circuits that are basically taking these, um, I guess, biological information. And it's, it's all Boolean. And the beautiful thing about Boolean algebra is that everything's reduced down to ones and zeros. But how does that really work when you're talking about biological matter? Is it really ones and zeros? And we deal with that in the electrical world. Um, you know, is this a high voltage? You interpret it as one and zero. But what's the equivalent of that? And do you run into those problems of this uncertainty? No, that's an, that's an excellent question. Uh, I'll be right back. <laughs> um, it's an excellent point. So the reductionist view that biology is on or off is an abstraction. So even if we did CMOS, we say it's zero volts and five volts. Mm -hmm. We still have something. There's still kind of a standard. Yeah. Biology, we don't have that. So each of those curves, the orders of magnitude might be different for each cell. For what turns this one on might be this many micromolar concentration. This might be some nanomolar concentration. Mm -hmm. So we don't have that. That's why it's important that each gate is characterized individually. Mm -hmm. so, what's a, so there is no universal on and off. It's a, it's a level between what we consider high and low, mm -hmm. and we hope the switching time is sufficient that we can isolate those. And so then what it does become is this mapping that I have to say, if I take a look at the, th I have to treat every gate differently. So this, this idea in CAD of this technology mapping problem is different. So let me be concise. We have experimental data for each, mm -hmm. and then for each one, 
we individually investigate its placement and use those relative inputs to say if they will relatively drive the, the other output. Okay. We have a notion of signal to noise ratio as well. Mm -hmm. And so that signal to noise, another colleague of mine has written up what it would mean to have a signal to noise ratio in biology okay. and we're trying to apply those metrics. So if I can put it again in my computer mm -hmm. engineer head, um, is that like saying you, you have a NOR gate, but you have many different flavors of the NOR gate given the signal, given the bacteria, whatever, and its sensitivity? C correct. Okay. Exactly, yes. There are many libraries for in different organisms. So we, okay. have, we have many different gates in E. coli, many different gates in yeast, many different gates in plant cells. So there's no universal NOR gate per se. Got yeah. it. Okay, Excellent thanks question. a lot. Stefan. Stefan's our latest uh, physics faculty member. Yes, yeah, so I'm actually going to ask a biology question. Um, so, um, just very ab abstractly speaking, are you able to now, for example, um, probe evolutionary processes? For example, um, you know, I, have, I have friends that look at viruses and how they evolve and they do experiments, and they have theories that they can tune to those experiments. So are you able to, you know, look in that direction as well? Yeah, so, the, so again, I mentioned we want to leverage what computing does well, and one of the things I mentioned was evolution. So how might evolution work into these? One of the things we'd like to do, and a colleague of mine is creating these artificial environments where we can keep cells alive for a long time. So evolution doesn't happen quickly. So what we need to do is have these microenvironments like the microfluidic, where we're now doing this over long time scales, days, months, maybe even longer. So that's kind of what's nice about these artificial environments is we can control that. So I might make a device called the chemostat that keeps this bacteria alive for one day. We do some measurements, two days. So what we are trying to do is look at the behavior of these cells over long lengths of time. And as the behavior s starts to change, we can use the microflux to subsample them. We can sample them, sequence the genome, see if mutations have occurred, and then we can see if those mutations happen in regular intervals. So we are working on how we can incorporate evolution. We can force this, there's a process in biology called directed evolution, where you introduce external factors to actually drive the evolution of the cell. We can make controlled directed evolution experiments as well. So instead of me injecting a new pH solution, I could inject, I could inject uh, different chemical inducers and, and biological agents that, that start uh, evolution and, muta and mutation happening naturally. Well, so you can look at, like, study the fitness landscapes, these kind of notions. For exactly. Okay. Yeah. Hi, I, I really liked your talk. I just wanted to ask something sort of like on sort of machine learning, I guess, applications, you know, in the sense of are you able to, are you looking at all into creating software that tests on its own, you know, the effectiveness of the circuits that are being designed um, in these DNA processes and then automated feedback um, on those specific circuits and, you know, that way, otherwise you, you have to test them in the lab and then, you know, a biologist or, or research assistant, right, is going to like type up this worked or this had this amount of output which was statistically insignificant, yada, yada, yada. Um, is there a way, I mean, I guess this goes with, you know, the, the robotics, controlled robotics, which you're now automatically assembling um, the actual process of, of genetic engineering and so on. Are you looking into that direction at all or is that not really a viable um, no. option? Are you an undergrad? Yeah. So you want to come? We're, we're going to get started. No, no, <laughs> no exactly. No, I, we are. So the question is, can we have a closed loop system where the computer designs a first experiment. It automatically assays. Assay is the term for test in biology, basically. It automatically assays that experiment, says, oh, I got this data. Based on that, let's do another experiment. The answer is yes. So this general idea is design of experiments. So imagine I have a, that, just like take your car, for example. If I said, what influences how fast my car is? Uh, the weight, the wheels, the engine, they're factors. And if I change them, I get different cars. But if I had lots of factors, it's impossible to change them all because I, that means I had to make a billion cars. So what design of experiments does is say, which choices should I pick in that landscape that are going to give me the most interesting data points? We have a software tool, I showed it briefly, called Double Dutch. It does that. So it chooses which experiments we do. We then build them. We have assays specifically designed to learn about the fitness of the cell and the behavior. And then what we are working on is feeding that back into Double Dutch again to do the next round of the design of experiments. Then what we do, I was talking to a computer science professor here, we make a special graph 
that starts to show which designs were working, which weren't. Mm -hmm. And so then we can share that graph with other people and you won't ever, you will never make a bad design again. That's the philosophy. So are you ever hoping for a way for the computer itself to generate like a circuit, you know, like um, on its own in, in the future, say five, 10, 15 years, I don't know how long, but uh, like with Double Dutch, there's a way of like sort of self-referential or rather a closed loop, right? I'm just wondering, is there a way like where I can just type in, I want this? and I get a, well, a candidate circuit. That's where we're going. Okay. Like right now, saying that is a little, we still need to probe, push the computer a little bit, give it logic. We have to give it initial starting points, but that's where we're trying to get to. All right, cool. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for the mind-stretching uh, experience. Uh, just a practical question. Is there a trajectory where the synthetic biology computing is competitive to silicon in, in some some fashion. It doesn't seem like it's fast. Uh, it, it seems like it's hard to get, you know, phys or uh, practically difficult to get complexity. So what's the trajectory to compete? Or maybe it's not even the goal to complete with silicon-based computing. Speed, parallelism, fuzzy. Uh, where, where is it meant to, to compete with that kind of technology? So the vision could be yes, because your biology you just ask this question. You ask it really quickly. Your brain was processing parallel. We're all biology. So the answer is we know observationally that biology can be extremely powerful. Now, are we going to get there in my lifetime? I don't know. So right now, the vision is not to compute with computers, but rather do things computers can't do. Go in extreme environments. There are bacteria that can live in lava, or not lava exactly, but extremophiles, deep sea conditions. So create living systems that either do things bio, that biology can't do well, I mean, computing can't do well, or computing can't do cheaply. So that's the first goal. But long term, I mean, that could be, I mean, we know the, plat, we know the capacity. Imagine if you had a microprocessor and you looked at the, your, your control panel and says it's working at 1%. You'd be like, we really want to get this up to 100. That's what we're doing now. Biology is working at less than 1% compared to a human. So that's what we're trying to push so we have the potential. Oh, yeah. Uh-oh. No, 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 we got more. Please. Thank you. Fun stuff. Most of what I saw was either bacteria mm -hmm. or acellular stuff. You just ground up the cells and you had cell-free me media. And then you're capable of making some conclusions about the design of the, your, each of your parts. Many people are very interested in human stem cells, for instance, and how those might be applied and how you might be able to apply what you're doing to those cells. The question is, are, are the rules going to be the same, or do you have to make some significant changes in how you're doing your design process if you're now going to apply those to a eukaryotic cell, specifically a stem cell? Yeah, yeah so again, the, the general question is, what you guys saw was in bacteria or cell-free. That's true, that's my expertise, if I had one in biology and where I focused. There are synthetic biology folks that work in yeast and human cells. So I do expect the rules to be different, but I expect them to be able to be expressed with the same software. So again, if I have, we'll, we'll have a whole new sets of what parts work together, which environments work well, which pieces are required, but I think the computing languages that I've created can still capture those rules. So what I would need to do is partner with someone who's working in mammalian cells, in T cells, et cetera, and start to do experiments and start generating our own rules. And that's kind of, there's a person I put up on the slide at BU named Wilson Wong. He came from Wendell Lim's lab from UCSF. I know Wendell has had, IG, UCSF always had an iGym team. Um, and so he works with T-cells specifically to do cancer therapies. And so he and I work together on circuits that he's making for T-cells through a system he calls Blade that use, uses recombinases. I know, and so it's a different system, different rules, but the same tools can express those rules. Very good, yeah. I look forward to it. Yeah. Okay, please. Um, I mean, a lot, of the, a lot of the talk that we just heard was about the, the promise of the approach that, you're, that, you, that you've taken on. Uh, I, I'm a little, I, I'm, I'm certain that you must have had successes along the way, uh, but I wonder what, uh, but you didn't show them. Um, I, I just wonder what, where you've seen the best results. I mean, what, uh, uh, what reactions have you created that have actually had uh, useful and interesting outcomes yeah. that, that uh, I mean, what, what, circuits, what circuits have you done that seem like they're going to have the most utility uh, going forward? It, it, um, I mean, I, I, think, I think what you're doing sounds wonderful, but I, I wonder where the... Uh, are you a grant program manager? Uh, no. <laughs> no. No, I'm just teasing. No, excellent question. What are we going to do with these? And I often don't emphasize those in my talks, so sometimes I feel, 
I have not contributed to that myself. That's often a lot of the work on standing on the shoulders of giants of other biologists, so often I don't feel comfortable taking uh, credit for these. The kinds of things that my tools have been involved in, take for example, at the Joint Bioenergy Institute. They make biofuels. So we've used circuits that we've put into yeast to change the behavior of yeast to produce biofuels. So I don't have the statistics, but they've increased the yield of these biofuels, so we can get biofuels faster. Another one is a big synthetic biology success story is the production of artemisinin, which is an anti-malarial drug. So we can get this from wormwood, we can get this from plants, but synthetic biologists have used the types of tools I introduced to make artemisinin and deliver thousands of uh, basically uh, these, doses, these dosages to folks in, in Africa. And so starting to cure anti-malarial drugs. A company called Oxitec has designed mosquitoes that can't reproduce. And so we can start talking about, and you might be like, well, that's sad. Those mosquitoes are just not really bothered. They're just biting me. But in some places, as you guys know, they're causing malaria and, and great diseases. So those have been three really clear uh, places that synthetic biology is also playing. And I was talking to folks throughout the day. Another interesting place that synthetic biology ha has really started is in designer um, fragrances and, 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 and um, flavors. So you might be saying, oh, who cares? But if you think about the, the retrieval of, of Things like, I'm not, I'm not, basically, if I'm retrieving all of this agricultural product for a flavor, I'm harming the environment, I'm creating interesting working conditions, et cetera, et cetera, we can remove a lot of those with biological processes. So, again, I haven't done those personally, that's why I don't often list those, but the field can take those as a success. Okay, thanks. All right, well, thank you, and thank you, Rick, for that rousing opening to uh, the series. Uh, the next one will be in February, and we, there'll be another, it'll be a biologist who's gonna talk about uh, why cells, what cells think about themselves, what bacteria think about themselves. So thank you again, and thank the speaker again.